My name is James Makoviak. I am the outreach coordinator for the project um, for Eden Prairie and Minnetonka. On the line, we have uh, some of my colleagues from the project office. We've got Trevor Roy uh, in our communications department and David Davies in the Congo, Segolo also uh, with the outreach team. And then I also see a couple residents who've um, chimed in. I don't, if you could just introduce yourself, we appreciate it. We've got AG and Carolyn, if you'd like to. Uh, my name my name is Carolyn and I live in Eden Prairie and so I'm obviously very interested in this topic. Nice. Thank you, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. AG? If not, that's fine too. All right, just to let everybody know, uh, again, we're going to the we're going to do a short presentation. Well, we've got quite a bit of information in the presentation. We've got a full hour. And um, we won't, um, if we have to go later, we'll go later. If more people join us or if the, the conversation extends beyond the uh, 630 mark, we're not uh, gonna hold that uh, fast. Uh, also, I'd like to let you know that this presentation will also be recorded. So uh, in terms of comments, thoughts, um, uh, we just want everybody to be aware of that as well. So what I'll do is make this a little bit more informal. You know, we've got four or five parts to the presentation and I'll stop after each part and I will ask folks if they have any questions in that way. You know, as we move through it topically, uh, we'll be able to address uh, questions as they come up. All right, give me a moment. I'm gonna share my screen and I am going to Here we go. Put up the presentation. Here we go. All right, before I start, uh, does anybody have any preliminary questions or comments? No, I don't. All right, thanks. Now, Okay, what I, if you guys, Carolyn and AG, if you guys would just give me a moment here, I'm gonna to talk to my colleagues briefly. Uh, I'm having a little technical problem here, go, turning the pages, and I'm not quite sure why. And I'm wondering if you guys, before we move on, so I don't have to kind of endure what happened last night, if you could just kind of figure out why that's going on. I've got a PDF up and I'm pressing it sort of catches and goes and sometimes doesn't go. Any suggestions or thoughts there? No? All right, let's give it a go. Are you saved on the, are you saved on the laptop or on the drive? I am, I saved it uh, in my file, right? Ford Arrow would work, I guess. Try What's that. that? Ford Arrow? Yeah, I'm trying all the arrows. Okay, let's get going. Uh, I'll just, I just gets, seems to get stuck a little bit, but we'll, we'll keep going. All right, again, thanks everybody for coming. Metro Green Line Extension Virtual Town Hall for the City of Eden Prairie. Today's topics, we're just gonna do a brief project overview and update. We'll recap 2021 construction. We'll project uh, into 2022. We'll discuss briefly what the systems contract work is, safety and security and outreach and communications. So topic one, the project overview. For those of you who have followed the project, you've probably seen this slide before. This is the uh, 14 and a half mile alignment, fairly large construction zone that will extend the current green line, which runs from uh, St. Paul to Minneapolis. 16 stations, 14 and a half miles. At one, at once uh, revenue operations begin, people will be able to travel from Southwest Station all the way to St. Paul if they like with one ticket. Go again. Come on. Can I ask a question? Is this sure. meeting specifically about the construction itself or operations or both or? It, it can be whatever you want it to be. Any questions okay. you want, but the, the, the presentation is essentially going to cover uh, construction and, you know, sort of the next phase of construction and systems. And then we'll talk initially about some of the recent announcements 
to the changes that were made to our project uh, that we announced uh, last fall. Okay. All right. So I think right. I would, you probably have been asked about this at other town halls. I mean, yep. you certainly have the construction piece of it, but there's also the, the, the concerns that people have after it's up and running about, you know, homeless people and people urinating yes. on the trains and all of that sure. really icky stuff that comes along with it. Yep. Yep. No, that's all, that's all uh, fair game. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate it. I know that those are legitimate concerns people have. All right. So again, here's the uh, scope of the project. Again, 44 new structures, right? 29 new bridges. That includes the uh, light rail, pedestrian, roadway, freight bridges, <clears throat> as well as seven existing bridges modifications like you see on I-494 there. We extended I-494 on Flying Cloud Drive to include the LRT. We added the LRT to the uh, 494 bridge, six pedestrian tunnels and, then we, uh, tunnels, and then we have the two cut and cover tunnels, right? The big one in Kenilworth, uh, that's over 2,000 feet. And then we have the one we've recently completed the restoration of 62 under 62, put that back together. 15 Acre crossings, we, you know, in Eden Prairie, you'll see them like on Technology Drive off Flying Cloud, Viking Drive as well. 127 retaining walls. It's quite a large, vast, complex project. All right, project update. Now, some of you have heard that uh, we had originally projected our revenue operations to begin in 2023 and that we felt very confident about that. But in the last three years of construction, we have encountered uh, some additional scope increases or increases to the construction project. And uh, one is a corridor protection wall, and you can follow the line over. And basically that's like a mile long concrete wall that separates the rail corridor from the LRT corridor as we head into Minneapolis. Um, <clears throat> You know, dealing with the railroad is sometimes difficult. The railroad has a lot of power and uh, they've been around a long time. And they were very, uh, you know, gracious enough to uh, uh, negotiate with us. And one of the uh, stipulations they had was putting up this corridor protection wall. Now, when we handed off the civil contract in 2018, the design for that wall uh, and the cost of that wall were not clear. We had projected a certain cost, but we had left the design to the railroad to satisfy their conditions. And uh, then uh, not too long ago, we had received, I think about a year and a half ago or so, we actually received that design. And of course, now we have to fit that into an existing contract that we've already put out to bid. So that added, it was an addition to the bid, like a change order, a massive change order. And then, so we've had to uh, compensate you know, the schedule and costs for that. And then in addition, those of you who follow the, the news have seen some of the challenges that we have in the Kenilworth corridor in building that tunnel. And while, you know, it's not unusual, right, with very large projects, especially a tunnel, um, it's a fairly long tunnel in a very narrow corridor where we've had to make several methodological pivots, right, where we've encountered variables, encountered challenges uh, once we began the digging, once we began the process of constructing that um, tunnel. And so one of the variables that, uh, methodological variables that we've added here is a C-camp pile wall. Uh, one of the things I'd like to recommend to you, if you do uh, visit our webpage, there's a lot of tremendous resources there, but if you go to it, our webpage, um, then there's a tab for uh, project videos. And we've got several really useful, informative videos there, but one of them actually goes into some detail on the Kenilworth Tunnel and explains the construction process step by step. It's very informative, great visual images there as well. One of the things I just want to mention, I wanted to mention earlier was, uh, you know, you may notice too that we are not using the SWLRT uh, acronym anymore, Southwest Light Rail Transit. We used that up until the beginning of this year and we are now moving toward uh, referring to our project and it's by its rightful name, of course, it's the Green Line Extension. So the GLE is uh, what we're talking about. Uh, that's the terminology we'll be using here today. And you'll see us using our publications, our public communications and the rest, because we're obviously extending the current Green Line. Okay, so these are two, I mentioned the corridor protection wall, Secant wall, the, the methodological challenges in the Kenilworth corridor. 
We also have the Eden Prairie Town Center Station. That was also, like the, these other two, additions to the contract that was bid on in 2018. Now, you may ask, why is it the Town Center Station in addition? Well, it was originally part of the project, right, when we were doing in the design phase. But if you remember long ago in 2015, uh, we had some during uh, the design phase, we were asked to, we made a projection, I think, I don't know what we were at, 65 or 75 percent design, maybe more, but it became apparent that the price of the project was more than was originally estimated at that time. And so we were asked to cut a couple hundred million dollars. And uh, part of that uh, uh, reduction was the elimination of this town center station. However, your uh, city uh, staff, your city leaders decided it was very important to the city of Eden Prairie to have that station. And they took it upon themselves in order to raise the money uh, through grants and, and other uh, means in order to, uh, for us to put that back into the project. But of course it wasn't a part of the original bid and that's the main point here. These are, these are uh, uh, scope increases that weren't a part of the original contract that had to be included and added now after the fact into the contract after construction has begun, therefore increasing the cost and increasing the uh, schedule, of course, because you know the, we've got 14 and a half miles, very complicated, a lot of work to do, a variety of work, and we have um, uh, we needed to sort of fit that in. Some of the items, you know, when you're doing a project like this, you might be interested to know we've got some some things like some larger projects like the uh, tunnel are long lead items. They take a long time, but they're called critical path. The things that need to get done first before other things can get done all along the corridor. So now that you have, have that already worked out, now that you have these scope increases, that obviously affects the schedule, affects, you know, how all those uh, addition, how those, all those features and all those parts of the project and construction are completed. So it gets complicated fast but we've been able to work that through over the last year. And now I'm gonna play with my mouse again. Here we go. Sure. All right, so in summary, right? What you, what I, so in terms of these scope increases, you had the original construction schedule and cost, right? 2018, we put the bid out, it was accepted, we awarded it. Now we have a new civil construction agreement and some change orders and then, of course, that equals a revised civil construction schedule and cost. All right. And then with the revised, let's see if I can get rid of this. All right. With the revised project schedule and cost, right, you're taking together the, uh, these uh, other contracts, right, following the, the civil contract. We, I should mention, too, there's four contracts. The first one was the rail cars. That one we've already seen Siemens deliver, I think 27 or 26 or 27 new rail cars that will be used on, on the Green Line extension. Then we got staffing supplies, right? Overall project schedule and cost. So you have this revised civil construction from the last slide. Then of course we have the systems contract which follows the civil. So you've got your, your rail cars, civil contract, then the systems, which is the electrification. And then following that, we've got the supporting contracts, the testing schedules, the ticket boxes, things like that that need to be added that will take some time as well. So once you change like a domino effect, you change the civil contract, then of course that shifts the schedule and sometimes the cost, depending on how much time goes by for the contracts that follow, like the systems and the contracts. So you're just giving you a broad overview, you know, of some of the implications of some of these scope increases that were unanticipated which uh, then of course equals our revised project opening day and cost that we announced uh, later last year. Okay, just uh, again, same slide, some additional detail. Basically with the revised civil construction schedule, we were adding an additional 34 months. And most of that, you know, uh, a portion, good portion of that is to complete the Kenilworth tunnel that has to be done, uh, you know, in a certain sequence. Uh, and so there's really, if we can speed it up, we will. Uh, but at this point, this is our projection. And what's also going to happen and what you're going to see, particularly here in Eden Prairie, is that most of the civil work will be look like it's being completed. Of course, as civil work is completed in one of these 16 segments along, you know, these work segments along our 14 and a half miles, as those are completed, we'll hand it off uh, starting this year to the systems contractor. And you're going to start seeing the systems guys 
on the uh, railway, you know, on the alignment, and they're going to be hanging catenaries and electrical wires and putting in what we call chat traction power substations. We'll just kind of show you some photos of later. <clears throat> so that'll also be part of that. So once they're completed, right, it's going to look like a lot of it's done. And then once there's a certain period of time it takes to do the testing where, you know, at some point the project will look completed. And then, of course, we've got six to nine months, I believe, of uh, fairly sophisticated testing procedures that have to go on in order to ver you know, verify the guarantee the safety, you know, and just that everything works together all the way from St. Paul. So revised project costs will be known once we understand uh, what the revised system schedule cost is. Now, we have just completed or nearly completed the civil construction review based on the scope increases. We, then we're going to go on to the systems. And then we're going to go on to the revised supporting contracts, the fourth contract, and then we will have, you know, that project uh, opening day and cost, the final cost, we'll be able to uh, identify. Now, the budget. As you know, Green Line Extension has undergone cost-cutting measures already. In 2015, I think we cut $215 million. But we're very confident we're building a well-constructed line that meets the needs of the community. And, we're about 62% when the slide was made, we're about 60%, but I think with 62% of the civil work done, meaningful reductions, right, as a way to save money are not really possible at this point, given what's been constructed. So we require additional funding. Again, once we figure out what that final number will be, we'll need additional funding to complete the project. And we're work, we'll continue to work with our partners and we're confident we, in collaboration we'll identify those funding sources and be able to uh, compensate for and pay for you know these additional features all right one of the things that we like to point out of course because <laughs> it's an awful lot of money right uh we're talking billions of dollars and um but in order to really i think best understand the value of the project you know whether it's like buying a car or buying a house it's important to do a comparison of equal value, right? So, you know, for example, with the light rail, there are, you know, been light rail projects going on and being built and up are running all over the country for the last 30 years. And currently, I believe there are maybe up to 15 projects or more uh, of one size or another, different levels of complexity that are very different from ours, except that they similar in the way in that there are, are a light rail project, but they're going on now and they're under construction in different phases, just like ours. But we have a couple of peer projects that we refer to in Seattle. I think they're building four additional lines now, Portland, Houston. But when you look at it, you know, that first slide, that first yellow dot, uh, before we announce these scope increases and all the complications and the, you know, the schedule and the cost increases that follow, we were at about $152 million per mile. Uh, and now after those, we anticipate that price to go up to about 180 to about 190 million per mile. The uh, peer projects are about 200 million to 500 million per mile. Now, here's, an, here's a list of some of them, right? Pittsburgh, Seattle, Portland, Los Angeles. And these are just uh, a portion of, you know, any number of them going on you know, elsewhere in the country as well. And they're different lengths, different numbers of stations. And the cost per mile is, is something to consider when you look at the complication the construction, the complication of that project. You know, we've got these two really large, complicated tunnels. Some of these projects don't have tunnels. Some of them in, are in urban areas that are more dense, more difficult to construct in even than ours. So depending on the variables, depending on the conditions, that price will, goes up or down based on the level of difficulty. All right, but in addition to, you know, these scope increases and changes, we've already seen about $2 billion in permitted and planned community development. You know, early on you saw the Elevate project, which uh, was supposed to be constructed, you know, fairly near to when we were finished. But as things turned out for a variety of reasons, they were done uh, several years before. But there's a number of projects, similar development projects all over the corridor. There's, I think, five in Opus alone in Minnetonka. But you can see here, there's also projects in Beltline, St. Louis Park, you have uh, Hopkins, obviously. Uh, Minnetonka station uh, and Opus, and then of course there's a picture of Elevate. Now we also try to uh, maintain a fairly high percentage of um, construction contracts that go to DBE or disadvantaged business enterprises. And through so far throughout the civil contract, over 16% uh, 
uh, we've, and you can see the dollar amount there and the percentage that we've achieved, uh, which are, which is fairly high is something we're proud of. It's something that we continue to work diligently toward. You can see in the systems contract and the contracts that follow, you'll see uh, similar percentages. So overall, as far as the economic you know, value of construction goes, we've paid out over $53 million in revenue throughout the state in 65 of 87 counties so far as of July last year, and putting a lot of people to work in this area in, in the state of Minnesota, more than 1.8 million hours. You can see the number of paychecks uh, going out, 75% uh, of the counties, and we talked about the DBE and the number of construction and construction related jobs, 7,500. All right, before we go on to just uh, some of the overview of the construction work completed in Eden Prairie last year, do you have any specific questions that you'd like to discuss now? If not, I will carry on. Thank you. All right, here's a recap. Okay, we I talked a little bit about the four contracts, right? The uh, civil, so the rail cars, civil systems, and the testing contracts. We also have several um, sequences that have to be achieved in order, right, as we build the line. Here you can see the utilities. You know, a lot of what was going on in Eden Prairie when, you know, we, we really had an impact on your driving, and we're very cognizant of that and appreciate your patience uh, in the last couple of years. We're past that now, but a lot of that in the first year, in 2019 specifically, was utility work. You know, we in planning these projects, we work very closely with our city partners, and Eden Prairie was one of them, obviously. And, you know, to order to minimize work and sometimes even to save money by doing utility work that they're projected to do, you know, maybe 10 years from when we first discussed it, uh, we're, we're going to do it. But then we decided we were going to do it. We were going to be in that area. So rather than, you know, double up and rather than do things twice, tear things up twice, we incorporated a lot of that uh, the, that planning, utility planning in each of the cities into our utility planning. And that was a big job. And I'll, in the next slide or two, you'll actually see the number of utilities you know, that were affected. There's a lot of utilities that we had to work through to be moved, altered, or enhanced. And then, of course, after that, you saw, you witnessed at Needham Prairie, all the site prep, some buildings being torn down and just a lot of work. And then, of course, you've been witnessing for two solid years the structure, track and station work, Southwest Station, right? The Prairie Center Drive Bridge is very obvious, Valley View Bridge off of Flying Cloud Drive. And then you're gonna see a lot more of the systems work. Systems work won't be anywhere near as onerous, disturbing, right? Or even as visible as the civil work. Uh, generally, they tend to stay within the corridor on the track. They have their own uh, machines that run up and down the tracks that carry you know, their supplies and they do most of the work relatively quiet compared, quietly compared to the construction work. And so that will, you'll see a lot of that going on, hanging to the wires and the canton areas if you have any visibility to the project. And then finally, of course, prior to revenue service, as I indicated, there'll be, you know, a good amount of time that will go into the testing so that we have the safety and then the communications, right, and the operator training in order to uh, get to revenue operating day. Quick question. Um, sure. This might be a dumb question, but I don't think I remember seeing a second station in Eden Prairie. Is it over by the mall somewhere or? No, good question. Yeah. Uh, you know where Southwest Station is. It's in that, it is, if you know where Redstone is? Yes. Okay. Right uh, west of Red, Redstone. If you look down there, you'll see over the last maybe eight or nine months, the uh, framework and most of the station has been completed. The town center. So they're station. really pretty close together then. Yeah. But, well, yeah. What does getting off a train at Redstone do for me? I mean, there's a Champs and a few restaurants around there, but why would people yeah. want to have a station there? Yeah, good question. Obviously, there are a number of apartment buildings too, right? The Cascade, oh, okay. got the okay. Arrive running down there, and there's also going to be future development. I, I mean, see. I think at this point, we really don't know what's going to happen there at that property owned by Champs, right? But that's a, you know, that's a really super property there. Um, but to answer your question, you know, when these alignments are decided, it's a very, you know, in-depth and, and collaborative uh, process between the county, the project office, and the cities. That's obviously the alignment's going through. We've got five cities, right? And 14 and a half miles. So how do you get from Target Field all the way down to the terminus at the end of the line in Southwest Station? 
and what what you know what path should it take? And we call that the locally preferred preferred alternative of the LPA. Now that process in Eden Prairie, I wasn't actually around for that. I've been with the project for seven years, but that goes on well before you know design. That's something that's settled relatively early on. The county then is involved in that. And then once that's settled, they hand it off to the project office for the design phase. But obviously, uh, we, when, when Eden Prairie wanted that town center station, because, you know, in living in Eden Prairie, Eden Prairie is always in search of a downtown, right? It doesn't naturally have one. So they rebranded it. They called it town center station. Obviously, you may or may not know that what was Eden Road when you come off of Flying Cloud Drive, right, and you head down toward Redstone is now called Town Center Place. At, at some point this year, there's already, you could see the beginnings of the extension road that will run right west, will run down right behind Bolero in front of the station. There'll be some curbside parking and the rest there. And I think in future, the city would like to create a road from where we'll have a cul-de-sac down behind Bolero that will go directly you know, south to Singletree. So there's a lot of future planning associated with the location here. But I think they, in this case, with Town Center Place, they wanted something that would be, you know, as close to their downtown area that was some kind of accessibility, you know, to the mall uh, as well. And, you know, we work, we'll be, uh, we obviously we worked with Southwest Transit uh, down the, to co-locate eventually down at Southwest Station with them. And, uh, uh, you know, I know that in our conversations with them, that you know they're thinking obviously planning in the future as well and they're looking at you know what their business model is will be over the next 10 or 15 years with their small um you know the small uh, ride shares uh, that they have with their vans with the small tesla fleet that they have now and they've they've been you know they've talked to us you know in some detail about where we are going to locate those stations so that they can sort of help facilitate that last half mile ride right i see so there'll be, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces here, but I think, you know, to your, to your question, primarily, you know, Eden Prairie wanted to have that kind of presence in some kind of that, that town center place right in the heart in the middle of Eden Prairie. That was helpful. Thank you. Yep. Okay. As I, we said earlier, 2021, at the end of 2021, about 60% complete. You can see we had 25 bridges underway out of 29. This is throughout the corridor, eight of the eight tunnels, 114, 131 retaining walls. You see a lot of evidence of that in Eden Prairie, right? All five bridges down there are well underway or nearly complete. So we've got 95% of all those private utilities, which was a big job, 75% of the 1,300 public utilities I mentioned earlier in that first phase. And then we had, of course, we completed the building demolitions at site prep. And now the systems contractor, as I indicated, is mobilized. Now, you may be wondering what Franklin Operation and Maintenance Facility is. Originally, when this project was designed, we actually had a full operation and maintenance facility plan to be put in Hopkins about halfway along the extension. Uh, but again, similar to the town center place. And if you remember, actually, I didn't mention this, but the project uh, alignment was supposed to originally go to Mitchell Road near city center, but that was also axed during these cost cutting measures in 2015. But that operational maintenance facility was also uh, taken out of the project as well. And it was supplemented with an enhanced OMF at the um, Franklin Center, which is where a lot of the maintenance currently takes place in Minneapolis. And then again, the 26 of the 27 light rail vehicles have been delivered. 11 of the 16 stations here you can see that's the shady oak station there in downtown hopkins when complete right obviously as we indicated i thought i said earlier there'll be a real fairly stress-free free ride and uh, all the way from eden prairie to minneapolis and one thing i want to mention too it was i think go often goes unsaid or not often said enough is it's going to be a beautiful ride right if you look at the number of bridges just between here even in hopkins and you look at where they go, there's a, you're, you're elevated for most of this trip. And then under the tunnel in 62, you come out into Opus, you're gonna be elevated for most of that and get views and see parts of you know that kind of drive corridor that you wouldn't have had before. I think people will be pleasantly surprised by that. All right, so in Eden Prairie, 2021, you can see some of the advances in Southwest Station. We've got the, the third level of the platform up on the bottom left of that first photograph, you can see which will what will eventually be the new ticket 
center, the new indoor ticket center. And on the right, we've included that photo just again to, for those of you who remember the bad old days of all the piling, if you happen to live near it, the loud and uh, disturbing piling, you can see just the amount of piles that go into securing you know, the foundation work so that we don't have any sinking or any problems in future. And you can see those that little minefield there, a pile field rather, you can see how many there are near which will eventually be the bus loop, the new bus loop. And again, looking really from the same direction of the pro uh, project, the photo on the top left rather, you can see that ticket station all the way in the difference, all the way in the distance rather. You can see the beginning of the bus loop here and the new um, exterior of the addition, 450 parking spaces. This is taken from the top of the parking ramp. You can see, you know, Prairie Center Drive Bridge. Now, when we're leaving the station, elevate on your left. Shops will be on your right there. And of course, the uh, water tower, which is, we use that all for direction. This is again, looking at the other direction, toward elevate, toward Southwest Station, on the far end of Prairie Center Drive Bridge, overlooking Prairie Center Drive. And at night, I don't know if you've been down there, but um, Eden Prairie um, added these lights and uh, they're very beautiful. They can change them any color they want, uh, depending on the season or whatever event is going on. Here's your uh, Eden Prairie Town Center Station. And here we're looking east, so just past this station, right? Or on your right, I should say, is this town center place, right? And then if you continue down that road, you know, right at that light, if you can see it in the distance, Redstone will be on your left and that'll be Town Center Station. And behind the station, of course, is Rosemont Emerson. You can see there'll be some street parking there. This was some of the before and after of the heavy construction as we tore up Eden Road or now Town Center Place. Uh, in the left-hand photo, you can probably tell there, uh, Redstone again is a, is a landmark is on your, uh, about the middle of the screen on the right. And of course, we put that all back together and finished that up last year. Tracks are being already laid. We'll be putting up some more decorative fencing this year. And this is the Valley View Road. This one I like very much because it's, I think it's one of two bridges where some of the piers were given an extra decorative element. You can see that's beautiful. It's got sort of the imagery, the motifs of Eden Prairie. Uh, that said, when you are on, um, what is that, Valley View Road? When you're coming into Flying Cloud Drive there. And moving further, we go, you know, over Valley View Road, we head on 212 East, right? We get, get off at Shady Oak Bridge, and then we go down Flying Cloud Drive, West 70th Street. There you'll see a Golden Triangle Station. I don't know if you followed in the news, there's another new development project in Eden Prairie going on right behind or to the left here of Golden Triangle Station. There's a big piece of property that Liberty used to own and left undeveloped where there's, I think, North Stem. Uh, development is going on, so they're going to put in a fairly large and complex uh, development there. They just got the final approval, was announced uh, just this week in Eden Prairie. And that, of course, uh, Gold Triangle Station looking uh, due north. When we leave that station, we end up on Prairie Center or uh, Highway 212 uh, Shady Oak Bridge. And these are some photos of it during construction. You can see 212 there on the left hand photo. Highway 212, both directions. This is looking west. And then the picture on the right is looking really, if you're, if you're just south of Highway 62 there, in the city west area, looking uh, south. <coughs> That's the other end of the bridge. All right, now we continue you know, up uh, off of uh, Shady Oak Bridge. We are on the grade level. And then we take a hard left and we uh, stay go west along the south side of Highway 62, and we enter City West Station. This will be a fairly large plaza. There'll be a lot of parking here as well, associated with the Optum campus as well. And in the far distance, you can see the south end of the Highway 62 tunnel. This is what City West will look like when it's completed. Yeah, you can see some of the tunnel work here on that south side. The you know middle really, and then after, and if you drove on 62, you would have experienced some of the uh, shifts, lane shifts over the last two years. We've got that all put back together in its original form. Now we had to build the tunnel one half at a time, and that's a picture you wouldn't get to see very often 
inside the tunnel as they were laying tracks uh, late last year. All right, any questions about you know the construction in 2021? Um, I was reading in the Star Trib recently about the, those condo owners from that old flour mill or whatever it is finding cracks and such in their, in their Sika, yeah, in Minneapolis. That, has that been um, resolved or what's going on with that? Uh, do I have David still on the line here? Let's see. I got to expand my view here, see who's still on the line here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me just introduce you, Dave. Dave is the outreach coordinator. He's a supervisor now of our outreach team, and he works right in the heart of Minneapolis. He's, he's much more familiar with that with me, so I'll let him comment on that. Okay, Carol? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Dave. Well, yeah, thanks for your question. Um, so, right, uh, this was in the end of January where uh, cracks and separation were observed at the Cedar Isles condos. Um, we are... Basically, the information that we have today or where we are today, our status is that the investigation is currently ongoing um, regarding those cracks. We brought in um, a consultant immediately uh, uh, who specializes in forensic uh, structural engineering analysis. And so the, this consultant has uh, been working to investigate. Uh, certainly, we're, we're they're, they're taking all the data that we have from um, our monitoring instrumentation, um, our work activities that were being conducted, as well as just the conditions of the building itself. Um, and, and so they've, they're, they're, they've amassed a lot of that information and are working through um, kind of analysis to, to see what they can find regarding the uh, the cause, um, if possible, of those cracks uh, and separation and and certainly what what is going on with the the Cedar Isles condos. There's certainly been a lot of uh, questions about why that would happen, and you know we don't know yet what the cause is. That's that's kind of the take home message at this time, um, but we certainly want to keep uh, the community informed about this. Um, at the same time, we we want to respect the relationship uh, between the project office, the project, and uh, the Cedar Isles condos members. Um, as if you know, these since they are condos, we're dealing with multiple property owners in this one in this one development. So we are working through that. We meet weekly with uh, the um, association representatives there to kind of continue this process of investigation and just figuring things out. I was out there yesterday, in fact, kind of with with the consultant as they're even gathering further investigation. So there's probably more to come. Um, you'll, <laughs> it, it wouldn't surprise me if there's more, you know, reported about this, but um, we will certainly be planning to share uh, more information about it. And certainly we're trying to find a pathway forward to restarting construction as well in that in that area. So um, more to come there, um, probably in the next uh, you know, three to four weeks is, is what I would expect. Thank you. It's just worrisome as a taxpayer to see the cost just ballooning for something that it's like, yeah, when people really are not even going to be going to the office as much anymore. And it's, yeah, it's just kind of disheartening to see sometimes just how expensive this is. Yeah, you know, when and I have to, and I'll be very frank with you, Carolyn. We would, we were all just disheartened by that, right? We're tasked with building right, this project. Um, long, you know, we didn't make the decisions necessarily. Uh, we were big supporters of it, obviously. We, we see the value of it, um, all things considered. But you're right, right? We were all disheartened by the fact that a we weren't able to complete this in 2023. Um, and also that it, it's going up as much as it has. Um, so we do share those sentiments, and uh, we, but we will be as responsible as we can be, as we've continued to be, I think, uh, if the truth be known, in being as diligent as possible in order to provide, you know, this safe um, and uh, I think ultimately very effective part of the regional transportation system. But we do hear you on that for sure. I appreciate yeah, and I think that, I think that really comes across just in hearing you guys talk about this. I mean, obviously you're professionals and you're trying to do a really good job and I realize things are out of your control. So yeah, it's it's actually kind of just good to hear all this. 
I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Can you guys just give me 30 seconds? I've got a um, email or a text here from your senator, Steve. Please don't. Uh, I can't. Swazinski, I think. Senator Steve, and uh, he's been trying to get in here to the uh, alignment, and unfortunately, he's been unable to do that. So I just wanted to see if I could get him this link, cut and paste it real quick, and if you don't mind. Yeah, right. I do see him as a participant. James, we I'm did? here. Oh, you're here. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't get in. I, it's a, yeah, I'll talk to you offline about it. Yeah, Thanks. no worries. All right. Thank you, uh, Senator. Sorry, uh, I, I don't have my full screen on here because i'm trying to watch and observe what's going on with the powerpoint but uh thanks appreciate it. thanks for letting me know that carolyn all right 2022 construction highlights yeah i'm back to my button issue again all right eden prairie this is again looking forward and here we just have a general map high level map of some of the work you can anticipate i think the the the, the takeaway here is that all that heavy disruption, the traffic disruptions, right? The road restorations, that's all been completed. There may be occasional lane closures and there may be short-term road closures. Uh, we've got one on West 70th Street. We've got a little bit of work to do still down uh, near Southwest Station on the roads there, but not, nothing anywhere near the disruption. And we're all very grateful, right? To the city of Eden Prairie for being for enduring that. We know how disruptive that was. You know, we'd all encounter that ourselves, some, depending on where we live. So we appreciate that very much. But this, you'll see by this map, there isn't anything like that going on. You know, we, we mentioned here, uh, for instance, you follow my arrow, traffic impacts are expected, you know, but periodic lane and closures here, nothing terribly much going on. This is in this area down by Southwest Station. And then we've got some bridge construction to be completed, right? Most of that is part of the superstructure. It's vertical, it's on top. You're not gonna really see a lot of that going on. There may be some painting, punch lists as well, because for instance, like with the Valley View Bridge here, that is uh, pretty well underway here. And then you see this follow up here below the Golden Triangle Station sign here. Uh, you'll see that little red line, that'll be West 70th Street. Sometime in the spring, we'll close that for a couple weeks to, in order to do our uh, grade crossing there. From the track crosses from you know that corridor uh, near Old Blue Stem to uh, Golden Triangle Station. So we don't have as much work. Eden Prairie probably has more civil work that's been completed or will be completed by the end of this year. So uh, we've gotten past the worst of the, con civil, uh, the civil construction disturbance. All right, the highlights. Again, stations, you got Southwest Station, Town Center, Golden Triangle, and City West. The four stations in Eden Prairie are, as you saw through those photos, are is well underway. And same thing is true for all the bridges, Prairie Center, the I-94 edition on Flying Cloud Drive and the bridge deck. We've got the Valley View Road Bridge, Nine Mile Creek Bridge, which runs uh, Flying Cloud Drive just east of uh, Highway 212 between Valley View Bridge and uh, Shady Oak Road there. And then we've got uh, the, the larger, the second largest bridge in the corridor, Highway 212 Shady Oak Bridge. We showed you some photos of that as well. We'll be working on top of that as well. There may be nighttime closures on Highway 212 once or, 12, once or twice. We like to do those like from 10 p.m. to like 6 a.m. before rush hour, uh, just uh, in order to preclude uh, disrupting anything, but they'll be brief probably overnight if we just for safety reasons as we have to work overhead and then of course the track work uh you see that already for instance it's most visible right there in front of redstone at town center place along flying cloud drive and we're going to continue you know the north northwest expansion of that track work this year traffic impacts this year in summary uh eastbound highway 212 off ramp to prairie center drive at some point we're not sure if it'll be this year or what time this year. There is a slight possibility it could float to next year, but at some point we need to do some work on that approach panel, uh, on that off ramp in order to uh, deal with some, some ground settling that occurred when we were building a Southwest station. Then of course, West 70th Street, I mentioned earlier, brief uh, closure there. 
but doesn't really disrupt anybody from Flying Cloud Drive. If you work on, you know, in Golden Triangle there, Shady Oak Road will be an access point. And of course, as we always have, we'll try to provide effective uh, road detours in our maintenance of traffic plan for any kind of closure, short term or more longer term. And then two things we need to do uh, is uh, we need to we need to what we call mud jack or lift the tracks that are sitting in tubs in our grade crossings at Technology Drive off Flying Cloud and then Viking Drive off Flying Cloud. Um, they need to go up about an inch. So it shouldn't take very long. We're in the process of uh, planning to uh, see what that looks like at another grade crossing in Opus. And once we get that technique down, and we should move pretty quickly. But you can see these are all relatively minor. And then there'll be per periodic lane closures. You probably won't even notice. Nothing will be dis really disrupted terribly with the traffic flow. And then, as I mentioned, uh, that third contract, the systems contract, they'll continue constructing foundations for what we call our TPSS or traction power substations. And those are essentially uh, located about every mile to provide the energy electricity that goes out to the Canton areas and the wiring system that actually powers the train. And in terms of milestones this year, uh, the Prairie Center Drive, Valley View, all those bridges should be substantially completed this year. And then also we anticipate uh, the relocation of Southwest Transit back to what will be you know, the future co-location for uh, uh, ticketing office, indoor waiting area for Southwest Station and the LRT light rail. But you know, it's quite a bit of work that has to get done. We'll, at some point, once we finish the paving, we finish the station on the, see this photograph where my, on the left-hand side here, that is where the new ticket will, uh, station will be. Um, once that's all operational and the buses can go in and out of there, then we will tear down the uh, temporary bus station we constructed two years ago. Now, very briefly, for those who want to know more about the systems work, we have another joint venture, two large electrical contractors, Aldridge and Parks, Parsons. It's project team management, about 25 people, craft workers, 40 to 50 subcontractors. You can see some of the interesting, very custom vehicles that they use to run along the tracks to do most of their work. Uh, just um, west of Valley View Drive, you can't really see it. It's hidden. It's on the uh, north side of Valley View Bridge. We're there off of Flying Cloud Drive. You see the foundation for one of those TPSS stations. And then here you can see what they'll look like. They're just like, like large containers. And inside you see quite a bit of uh, electrical, sophisticated electrical equipment. All right, another thing we wanted to talk about because we've heard, I've heard this concern, you know, often expressed in Eden Prairie. I know we've got obviously, you know, a ways to go now with the extended revenue operating date. But um, safety and security obviously is important, something we take very seriously. And it's something that we're going to continue to uh, develop in terms of our message, in terms of communicating to the residents of Eden Prairie that, you know, this will be a safe, and to your point earlier, Carol, uh, clean and reliable uh, system of transportation. So I don't know if you're aware, but the Metropolitan Transit Police Department is made up of 141 sworn full-time police officers, 50 part-time, staff for 24 hours a day, and they work closely with uh, law enforcement in local cities. Now, they're already doing that. Uh, the uh, Green Line Extension Project and and the, uh, uh, the uh, Metro Transit Police Department has already begun the pre preliminary work, right, of working closely with your law enforcement, Eden Prairie Emergency Services, to ensure that when revenue operation begins, it'll be a well-planned, safe, and secure, you know, coordination. And then we'll conduct safety education outreach probably a year before revenue op service begins. We'll get a lot more information out there, you know, as we get closer to it, to just try to listen and hear what people's concerns are and find both proactive and reactive ways in order to address their security and safety concerns. And just a little overview here of uh, the project office. These are some of the things that we've done uh, in the design and incorporating into the contracts <clears throat> to ensure passenger, pedestrian, trail user safety. <clears throat> There's something called the CPTED, crime prevention through environmental design through <clears throat> it's a fairly uh, widely used set of best practices that we've incorporated into our design. And then of course, uh, uh, proper and sufficient safety lighting, cameras, there's emergency services. You can see in these blue lights, 
in the phones that are there, safety lighting cameras, right? It'll be very well lit with public address systems, so on and so forth. And then uh, accommodations for the MTPD members uh, at the park to park at those stations. And we've got a couple other things here, designated pedestrian parking, cro bike crossing at the grades as well to ensure safety. And then finally, <clears throat> communications and outreach. Um, we've got my colleague uh, Nakongo here. Uh, he's at a, what we what we often do, and we're looking forward to doing again here, is sort of an in-person tabling of um, <clears throat> public events. We recently got an invitation at Arbor Day now, Eden Prairie starting to ramp up summer activities. Unfortunately, I won't be able to attend that, but probably will be at the July 4th uh, Star Lake uh, event this year, but it's going to be nice to be back outside again or even back indoors. Uh, we get a lot of requests uh, from Eden Prairie residents and community uh, organizations to make these kinds of presentations that people are increasingly more interested in the project and seeing uh, what stage we're at and, and how far we have to go. If you want to follow, you know, this construction a bit more closely, if you're if you don't know, we have something called the construction update that we are, we send out uh, generally every week, every late, every Friday uh, to uh, anybody who subscribes uh, by email. We've got over 1,600 uh, subscribers already. If you go to our webpage at uh, greenlineextension.org or we still you can still go there with swlrt.org, you'll be able to see a link and you put your email address on and you will get that information. Now that'll provide the best information every week uh, about construction that's going on throughout the five cities. So if there's any detours, there'll be maps there. If there's any issues related to trails or any trail openings that we were able to release, uh, that information will all be provided there. So you get a pretty good overview of construction for the upcoming week. We also have our hotline call. We've gotten hundreds of hotline calls of all sorts um, during the construction. And uh, this past year, we, it's gone down a little bit to 31 calls as construction started to reduce down. And then, of course, I get hundreds more uh, hot, uh, direct calls or non-hotline calls and emails from community members. And I just want to extend that uh, invitation to you who are listening as well. You know, please, uh, you see my email address here. Feel free to, to uh, write, contact me for any reason at all. Any questions, any concerns, or any comments that you have, I'm more than happy to engage with you. We also have something called the Public Information Work Group. It's a committee we created before construction started with uh, city appointed uh, business people, community members to be a part of uh, a regular, it's a little less regular during COVID, but the first year was a more regular meet committee meeting where they provide input to us uh, based on our overview of what we're doing, uh, input about maybe what we could do better, you know, and maybe uh, what they're hearing from the community. It's been, a, you know, a very valuable uh, committee to be able to, you know, to get that point of view that we might otherwise not get directly. And then something we're really happy about, we had a lot of fun with last year, were our public walking tours. We had uh, uh, three in Eden Prairie, and we're going to do something similar. Uh, I, I think we'll probably try to get as many, at least that many this year as well. You know, they're really great because it, and they'll be posted again on the construction information work group. I think the city, your city also posts them as well on their link to our page. And you'll be able, you know, people have been able to walk the Prairie Center Drive Bridge, go down into, you know, the tunnel areas, uh, just get really up close and personal with uh, construction. Some of it's very fascinating. It's very complex. We have a subject matter expert that joins us. And uh, it's just a lot of fun. People ask great questions. It's great to, you know, to have uh, that opportunity to meet people uh, from the from the various cities and have those conversations and see what they think and why they're looking forward to or not looking forward to the LRT. Right? It's just uh, it's all good, and we appreciate them taking the time to contact us. And finally, um, as I indicated, we'll be running some more of these construction tours this year. So we'll, we'll always have these pop up events, indoor, outdoor at fairs, parks, you know, or invited events. And then uh, we'll continue with weekly and you see bi-weekly construction updates. We, over the winter, there's not a lot of construction going on. So that weekly construction update reduces down to just once a week, uh, twice a week, twice a month. So we'll be ramping that back up again soon to once a week. And here's our social media presence. Again, our website, greenlineextension.org. Or again, if you, if you still, if you can't remember that one, remember the swlrt.org, that still works too. 
and then our Twitter, Instagram handles. And that is the end. All right, if everybody's still awake, I appreciate your attention. And uh, is there anybody who has any questions? Carolyn, I know I don't think we addressed directly your concerns stated earlier. Well, but yeah, so you were talking about the, the safety uh, aspect of it and, you know, the officers yeah. onboarding and all of that. Yeah. I'm assuming that that exists today with the existing rail lines, yet we hear and read in the paper and from anecdotally that, you know, there are a lot of people undesirable, homeless, you know, people who are, who you, you might, may not feel safe around that, you know, are on the trains and that they're not clean mm -hmm. and that people don't have to pay. And it's like, I think, you know, now that it feels like the train is inevitably coming to Eden Prairie, it's like, from what I read in here, I mean, that's what people are most worried about is bringing crime out to our suburb. And that's just a very scary thing. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I appreciate that question a lot. I mean, that's a real concern. And I think for, uh, you know, I'm from New York, right? So I'm probably a terrible person to speak on some of these subjects because I have this natural rail bias, right? I'm just used to it. I'm used to being on and off of trains, commuting, so on and so forth when I was young. But I realized that for a lot of people, particularly as far out as Eden Prairie, you know, the, the idea of a, a train coming out here, right, direct line, um, from the urban areas is new. And, you know, we do see a lot of negative press. You know, we get a lot of negative press in the green line. They tend, news media, let's face it, tends to highlight, you know, the more sensational, but it's also true that, you know, we have millions of riders every year. And uh, I have to say by far that some of the, uh, the, the media coverage is probably more of an outlier than it is actually consistent with, you know, the everyday experience of these millions of people who ride, you know, ride the train back and forth to work. But I'll also say that, of course, those things do happen. And with that in mind, you know, it is something that we don't like, right? It's something that uh, we uh, are going to continue to work hard to find equitable, you know, fair ways, humane ways in order to deal with some of the conditions because the train is just i think for more more or less the train is just symptomatic of you know a lot that's going on in our society around us and you know we may see that symptomatic example you know that might occur on a train but it isn't necessarily due to the train or because of the train or because of that mode of life you know it, it's a it is a public form of transportation so you don't have you know the same constraints as you would inside a vehicle but it's something that we have heard and we will continue to very to work diligently on you know obviously we want people to ride this train we want you to be comfortable and we want you to feel absolutely safe and that's our goal and we will continue to do everything we can right as this thing opens up and it's a new experience and coming farther out here to the suburbs i mean really nobody knows what's entirely going to happen I think it's going to provide a lot of opportunity, you know, for people coming from both ways. I'll tell you a story. Uh, recently, um, I got a phone call from uh, a gentleman. He's 30 years old. He's a single dad. And he lived in a place uh, called, uh, what did he call? Cottage Grove or something? Not Cottage Grove. Something, it's, it's north, you know, you go past St. Paul and you go north and I'm, as I said, I'm from New York. I'm, I don't even know the names of the cities there, but he was somewhere north there. And he had a job that he loved very much in Eden Prairie. He was a line cook. Uh, he was a chef, rather, like an associate chef or something, down at um, uh, the Kona Grill. And uh, he commuted all the way down there because he loved that job. And he, you know, he called me up and he said, look, I've been doing this for a couple of years. I'm spending all this money just to get down there. He said, is there some way, you know, that if you can help me with my transport, my commute? Now, obviously, even with our bus system, you know, we're just coming back now due to some of the, the shifts that went on, you know, necessarily during the COVID pandemic as things are starting to come back online. And to your point, Carol, right, we're waiting to see where, you know, where the, it all falls out, where, you know, how it all is going to shake out in terms of people being remote and so on and so forth. But the bus service was reduced in some areas. And so we're getting all that back online. And, 
But unfortunately, you know, after he went through his commute and I wasn't able to obviously give him any information or any help there, but I was just so impressed with his, uh, you know, this is the kind of guy, you know, if you've ever talked to a young person and, you know, you, you, when you, you hear their heart and you realize, hey, this is not a guy asking me for anything. This is just a guy asking me if just how to get there. Right. How, how can I make it better? I just don't know how. And, you know, I was really touched by this guy. And um, I didn't really do much for him. But for some reason, he called me a week later. You know, I went online and, you know, tried to help him with some services that might be available. Maybe other people might know more about the transportation options and costs or savings. I don't know. And anyway, for some reason, he called me up and he said, uh, you got to come down to Kona Grill. He says, I've got something for you. And I, I'm just shocked. I said, oh, well, I, OK. So I walked in and they obviously knew I was coming. I, they didn't, I don't know how they knew me. I've never met him before. They had a booth for me. And he came out. And he was just so grateful, right, to try to help him out. And as it turns out, in his case, he um, he was able to uh, he, he he got a, a chef job at the St. Paul Hotel. So he's closer to home. But I think you have a lot of people like that who are looking for opportunities. Right. And who are really going to benefit from, you know, the opportunities as well as, of course, the employers down here are going to benefit from having a larger uh, employee pool. We all see the signs on the windows and the doors. Right. It can't keep enough people in certain in a certain uh, sector of the job market. So I think I think people will be surprised. I think it's going to be a, a change. I don't think anybody quite knows what that'll look like. But I just want to emphasize that we definitely take seriously your concerns, Carolyn. We hear you. And, um, you know, as I said, as far as the safety and security goes, you know, as we get closer to that revenue operating day, we're going to provide, uh, you know, a lot more communication on that. And we're going to, we're going to, you know, listen, hear your input as well. You know, we, uh, we want this to work and we want this to be successful for everybody. And so far, you know, I'm fairly confident that at the end of the day, it will be. All right. Thank you. And thank you so much for this session. I really uh, learned a lot and I'm so very impressed by, um, yeah, by you guys and your de demeanor and professionalism and, yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Carolyn. Thank you for saying that, and thanks for for attending. Does anybody yeah, else? Have thanks any? for putting this together. Yeah, I, uh, my name is Andrew. I'm a homeowner here in Eden Prairie, and I I work in Eden Prairie as well. My office is actually within walking distance of that uh, of the town center station, so I wasn't aware that they were actually planning to build that. That's kind of exciting as well. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I I just happened to kind of stumble across this uh, on the website yesterday or the day before because I was interested in sort of the progress and progress update and saw that you were having this town hall. So thanks for putting this together. Um, I wish more people knew about it because I thought it, I found it fascinating and, I, and it, I didn't have any questions throughout it. It certainly answers all the questions that I may have had, um, but I think other people would benefit from it. So hopefully people, uh, you know, download the PDF and, and view the video on the website because this is fascinating stuff. And I think that it, there's a lot of people in the community that just be interested to see uh, yeah. progress um, and, and, and ultimately when this thing was going to come, you know, I mean, they've been working on yeah. it for several years. And so the, the delay to 2027, I think makes sense. Uh, we understand it's happening, but uh, I was really curious as, you know, when, when's this finally happening and, and, and when are we going to see the benefits? So this is good stuff. Is it 2027 or 2025? Yeah. Well, we, we've said 2027, Carolyn, uh, from 2023, 2025 is when we anticipate the civil construction will be completed, not in Eden Prairie. That will be construct, that will be completed you know, significantly completed. I, I don't think there'll be anything left by 2024 in Eden Prairie. In fact, most of the systems will be uh, put up, you know, those catenaries and the rest, they'll be working on that in 2022 here and then 2023. So you've got two years of systems work to follow. Most of that civil, about 95%, except for, you know, punch lists and other things like that are, are, are completed here. So, but elsewhere in the corridor, and particularly, you know, in a certain portion, you know, the Kenilworth corridor there in Minneapolis, you know, we're going to be working diligently to get that done. And hopefully we'll get that civil work done in 2025. But again, after that, you know, we've got this period of six to nine months of testing. So, you know, nobody, I, you know, I, I don't know if people believe me when I say this, but I think, uh, I think very few people are as motivated to get this thing done as we are, right? We really, but we want to deliver it safely. We want to just make sure all the T's are crossed, I's are dotted, right? 
So um, in terms of that date, a little more background, right? If people want to stay on, uh, you know, last year in January, we made an announcement because later, you know, probably late in 2020, we realized that some of these scope increases I mentioned earlier were coming online and that it was going to lead to, you know, some shifts in the schedule and of course, like the domino effect to the next schedule and the next schedule. And that all affects cost. And then, of course, we're in the middle of COVID. You've got everybody talks about the supply chain issues, the cost of things going up, We've got inflation going on now. So, you know, we took a year after we made that announcement to really do a deep dive and do a pretty thorough review uh, of all of these different systems, all these different schedules, all these contracts. And we've been working, negotiating it, like, for instance, just the first contract with the civil contractor for quite some time now right, in terms of all of these implications in order to come with a fair and equitable agreement in terms of how, when, how, with these changes, how are we gonna get that done and all these variables that were beyond anyone's control. So we've, uh, we've, we're have we putting the finishing touches on that and then we'll move on to the systems negotiation, right? And so on and so forth. But it's been going on for quite a while. So when we said 2027, you know, we're, we're really, nobody knows what, what else we could encounter, but we're 62% of the way through, right? But who knows, you know, it's like building a home, right? It's like constructing anything. You know, it's not uncommon in the construction business, right? To encounter unanticipated unanticipated variables and to have to shift and change and we'll continue to do that. But we don't know, but you know, 2027, you know, is we felt comfortable all things considered at the time we made that evaluation that um, that's pretty fair. Now we're gonna try and beat that obviously and you're going to see a lot of things going on. You know, there there may be, you know, most of the systems work on the east, in the western side might already be up. In fact, I'll mention to you that one of the things we are going to do, we're going to try to do, we're planning on doing if it works, is to um, truck out some of these rail cars once we get a significant portion of that western quadrant of the 14 and a half miles completed. You know, maybe through Hopkins or maybe St. Louis Park. And then we'll start the testing process, you know, as a as a way, as a strategy to try to save time on the back end. So you'll see cars probably running back and forth there. And um, again, trying to get ahead of, you know, this the little bit of the bottleneck and civil side there with the tunnel. And then maybe on the other side, on the eastern side of that tunnel, I don't know how much can, I'm not as well versed with that, but how much civil work or how far the systems will be. But you can see we'll get, we'll have civil work going on and trying to finish that up at the same time, trying to get ahead, get that systems work finished on the west side, probably starting on the east side, getting testing going, right? And just keep reducing down all the, the work that's remaining while doing a multivarious you know, doing multivarious tasks at the same time to try to, you know, to meet that date and, and hopefully beat that. All right, thank you. I've got to jump off now. Appreciate it. All right, it. appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, Andrew. thank you. Appreciate Bye. it. All right, well, I know we've gone past uh, 10 minutes past. Uh, I don't want to be respectful of people's time. Sorry, I jabbered on a little long there. I hope it was okay. Uh, I don't know, we've got Senator Steve. I think he might have bounced. It looks like he did uh, catch up with him again, but I've got, uh, I'm sorry, I don't want to mispronounce your name, uh, Ayan and Andrew on the line left. If you guys have any questions, let me know. It may, this will be the last call. If not, we'll call it a night. And uh, again, anytime you want to reach out, want to contact me, if you, you know, would like us to uh, you know, provide an event of some kind, pop up or otherwise, we'd be more than happy to do that. Is there a final round of questions or comments? Our team, anybody? I do have one question. Uh, sure. Like, how would I like figure out which station is closest to me? Okay. I'll tell you what. Are you, uh, have you been on our webpage? Yeah. I was okay. looking at it and I was having a little trouble figuring out from yep. just the maps. Yep. Well, if you go to the tab that says uh, project coordinators, you will immediately, I think, see or we'll, ha we'll be able to find on that page uh, the my details, my my phone number, my email. And if you could just drop me a little email, just say, you know, you were attended this, uh, you know, night before and just give me your address. I'll draw you a little map and I'll, and I'll show you uh, how far you are. Oh, wow, that'd be so nice. Sure. I'll look for your email. All right. 
All right. Looks like we uh, you're the last person standing. So if there are any other comments, we'll call it a night. Again, thanks, everybody, for hanging out late. And uh, have a good evening.